Hello, this week in Computer Science 345, we're going to talk about the queue data structure. Now, queues are sort of similar to stacks, which we talked about last week. In a stack, you essentially have a last in, first out data structure, which is just a term that is used for stacks, LIFO. So the last thing you added is the first thing that's going to come out. And for some applications that makes sense and is the thing you want, like for reversing parentheses, like you did in the lab last week, um, the thing that the opening parenthesis matches isn't the thing, the opening parenthesis that was added furthest to go, the first one, it's the most recent one that it's going to match. So for applications like that, it's going to make sense. Also for method calls, the method you return from is the one that you most recently called. So it's this last in first out kind of behavior. And we get that with a stack because we add to and remove from the same end of the structure, the same end of the array or the linked list, whatever you're basing it on. Now we're going to talk about queues, which are called sometimes a first in, first out data structure or a FIFO data structure, because with a queue, it's the other way around. If you're taking something out of the queue, the thing you're taking out is the thing that you added the longest time ago, the thing that you added first. And when it comes to implementing queues, instead of adding and removing both from the same side, you do it on opposite sides. So on one side, you add data, and on the other side, you remove data. Now, queues are used for applications where you sort of want to like save data in some sort of like temporary holding space and take it out in the same order that you originally saw it in. They're often used for things like buffers. So like, for instance, when you're watching a YouTube video or any other kind of video, you'll often see the word buffering, which means that it's like downloading the data and storing it in sort of like a temporary space where you can then pull it from. And when you do that, you don't want it to like reverse the video. You want to see it in the same order that the original file was in. So you would use a queue to do that. Now, queues are also can be used to implement things like waiting lines and things like that. So if you have a web server that is getting requests from web browsers, it can store all of the requests that it has to answer in a queue so that it can deal with them in the same order that they came in. In fact, the word queue in England is used for like a waiting line. So if you were going to the grocery store and someone called you, you in England would say like, hey, I'm waiting in the queue instead of waiting in the line. So it's basically like a waiting line data structure where we save data temporarily and get it back out again in the same order that it originally came in as. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at this. So like stacks, queues are what I like to call logical data structures because they do not rely on storing the data in any particular way in memory. Like a stack, you can use either an array or a linked list to implement a queue. The important thing that makes a queue a queue is that you add the data on one side of the data structure and you remove it from the other. So let's say we go ahead and add some names into a queue. Let's say that this queue represents some people waiting in line, for instance, and we'll go ahead and add first the person Alice. Again, we're just going to start by talking about this sort of logically. We don't need to draw an array or a linked list, but we'll use one of those two to implement this. So if Alice is added to the queue, then there would only be one item in the queue so far. Let's say we go ahead and add Bob to the queue next. Well, it doesn't really matter how we draw it, but let's go ahead and draw it over here and say Bob is added to the queue right after Alice is added to the queue. Now we have two parts of the queue. The start of the queue which is Alice, and the end of the queue, which is Bob. And so we can say that Bob is at the end of the line and Alice is at the start of the line. Now notice that we added Bob to the end of the queue, and like it doesn't matter if you draw it sort of on the left is the end or on the right is the end. It doesn't really matter so long as you're consistent with it. And so if we were going to enqueue somebody else, like let's say Claire to the queue, we would have to do it on the same end that we added Bob. You always add to the same end when you're using a queue. So if we have done these three operations, we've added Alice, um, then we added Bob, and then we added Claire, it would look like this. So we've add, add, and add. Now, let's say we go ahead and we do a remove, which can be called a dequeue. Just like stacks have push and pop, queues have in queue and dequeue as verbs that you can use to 
to mean adding to and removing from the queue. They're not used as widely as stacks. So for instance, Java's stack class that's built in with the Java library comes with push and pop as its methods. It just has add for in queue. And I, I forget what it has for DQ, but it's not, uh, it's not DQ. So we can use those terms sort of interchangeably. I don't know. But either way, if we've added Alice, Bob, and Claire to the queue, then it would look like this. Alice is at the start, Bob is in the middle, and then Claire is at the end. Now, if we were going to DQ, what would happen is that Alice would have to be removed from the queue, right? Because we add on one side and we remove from the other. That's the key thing that it makes this a queue. So if we were going to remove Alice, it would look like this. Now we've got Bob in the start position and Claire still at the end position. To go through this just a little bit more, imagine we go ahead and add someone else, sort of keeping with the alphabetical theme. Let's say we add Daniel next, then he'll of course appear at the end. So it goes always adding to one side. And again, you can think about it either side you like as long as you're consistent. So that's what it looks like after Daniel is added. And then let's say we add someone else. Let's keep with the pattern, I guess, and add someone named Esther. This is what it would now look like after I've scooted this down a bit. Bob is still at the start, then Claire, then Daniel, then Esther finally at the end. Now let's say we do another DQ operation. Well, of course, the person that's gonna come out is who? Uh, hopefully, right, uh, Bob, not Esther, because remember, this is the first in, first out data structure. So Bob is the first one in at this point. He was added right away, right after Alice. And so now Bob is gonna be the first one that comes out. So this DQ is going to remove Bob from the list, look, leaving it looking like this, like that with Bob removed and now Claire at the start of the list. So the queue keeps the things in the same order that they were put in as, and it returns them back to you in that same order. It's basically like a temporary holding area for data where when you put it in, it is kept safe inside of the queue and then it comes back out in the same order you put it in as. Hopefully that makes sense. Next, we'll talk a little bit about the applications of queues, some of which I already mentioned. One that is really the biggest one, I think, is saving data in a temporary space or a, what is also called a buffer for data. So the place that you all have seen this word buffer or buffering probably the most is when you're watching videos or listening to music. And I'll use YouTube as an example. When you have a YouTube video, you have this little bottom bar thing. And there's basically like three parts of the little bar. There's the red part, which kind of represents the part of the video that you've already seen so far. And then there's a light gray part that looks like this maybe. And then there's another part of the bar that's dark gray or maybe black, like this, that makes up the whole rest of the thing. And the red part, of course, is like the part that you've already watched, right? Then this black part over here, so this is watched, this black part over here is the part that you haven't downloaded at all. Not downloaded. And this gray part in the middle here is the part of the video that's buffered. So that means that your web browser has already downloaded that part of the video, but you haven't yet got to it. You haven't seen it yet. And when you're watching videos, you want this to not be empty because if it gets empty, then you might have to pause the video for it to buffer and it says buffering and it's kind of frustrating, right? But this is basically essentially a queue. The data frames from the video are added on one end so this is where you add, and then they're taken out from the other side, so you remove from this side. And remember, having the two opposite ends is what makes it a queue. So basically, the purpose of this queue is to make the video experience smoother by making it so that you don't have to download the frames and then show them to the user right away, because then if there's any hiccup in the downloading, then it's going to pause the video. So instead, we have this like temporary storage space where on one side we add the video frames that we just downloaded, and on the other side we take them out so that the user can see them. This is like the most visible way that you've seen a queue being used, but in any sort of application of computer science where you're sending and receiving data, 
oftentimes it's using a queue. So when you're using your web browser or any other kind of like networked applications, there's often buffering of data for the same exact reason. Another application of queues, a common one that I've talked about is when you have multiple sort of like requests that have to be handled. So imagine that you have a web server like google.com or youtube.com or facebook.com or any other website and then you have multiple clients clients in a web for a web server are web browsers so basically people lo trying to load up this website the clients are going to send requests to the web server and then the web server ideally is going to send the thing back that the client requested so like if you go to google.com you're going to request the home page and then the web server is going to send the home page back to you then you're going to make another request with your Google search and it's going to send the results page back to you and so so on and so forth. But what happens if you have like a bunch of clients all sort of making requests at one time, you may have clients C, D, E, and F all send requests to the same web browser at the same time, like at all at once. And so it can't respond to them one by one. Well, what happens is the web browser or rather the web server is going to make a little queue to store those requests and let's say it got them basically all at the same time but they come in as the order c d e and f well it's going to add them to one side so let's say it adds over here so it adds c and then it adds d and then it adds e and then it adds f well then it's going to take them out from the other side so it's going to take out c first and then take out d and then take out e and then take out F. And if any have been added in the meantime, it's going to add them on this side so that it's like a first come first serve sort of ordering. And so any sort of application where you have like multiple requests that you want to like handle in the same order that you got them in, a queue is the right data structure for that kind of problem too. They're also really good for like scheduling types type of programs. And anytime when you want to like actually simulate some sort of like line thing happening. All right, so now we need to talk about how we would implement a queue using an array. All right, so let's say we're gonna do this with an array of size 10 like this. Well, when we did it with a stack, we basically kept track of one variable, which was the top, which we kept equal to the index of the next available slot in the array where the top was being stored. But that's not gonna be quite enough for a queue because in a queue, we have to keep track of both ends. We have to keep track of the side that we add to, which I'm calling the end, and the slot that we are going to be removing from, which I'm calling the start. So we're initially going to start with both of these equal to negative one, just like the top when it was not valid because there's nothing in there, we set it equal to negative one. Same thing here, both of these are going to be negative one to start with. Now let's say we go ahead and we enqueue something. Let's say we add. Let's just go with the names example again. Let's say we add Alice to the queue. No, that's not good because I didn't put enough room for my array slots. Let's just do letters. So we add A to the queue. That's going to go in this first cell. And now both the start and the end are going to be zero, like that. So if there's only one thing, then both the start and the end are the same. But let's go ahead and fix that by adding another thing and say we add B to the queue. Well, that's going to go right here. And then the start is going to remain at zero, but the end of the queue now is in slot one. And so let's go ahead and update that so that we have start zero and end one. We have basically like two pointers into the queue now. One is where the starting point is, the head of the line, and then the other is the ending point where we're going to be adding new items. So let's add two more things. Let's go ahead and add C and also add D. When we add C, that goes here. And when we add D, that goes here. Let's add one more thing, which is E, which is going to go here. And that's going to make the end four and the start zero. Now let's say that we're going to go ahead and do a DQ operation. We're going to go ahead and remove something from the queue. Well, the thing that we're going to remove because it's a queue is the first one that was added, the one that was added the longest time ago, which is of course A. And so when we do that, we should get A back out. Just like pop for a stack, the DQ operation both removes the thing and also gives it back to us. 
So we're going to return A, and then we also want to remove it from the array. Now, just like a stack, we don't actually have to like delete it from the array we're using to store things. That's not really necessary, but we do have to update our indices. And so now the new start of the array is B. So we're going to increment start to make that happen. So it's going to look like that now. I'll go ahead and take the A out of there. Even though we don't have to like actually delete it, it'll be easier to see what's going on if it's not there. So that's what our queue looks like now. Let's go ahead and carry on with this a little bit so that you can see what's going to happen. Let's go ahead and do another couple of adds. Let's say we add the next few letters in the sequence. We add F and then we add G. That's going to put the F here and the G here, of course, and our end is going to be six, which looks like that. And then let's say we remove two more. That'll get the B taken out and the C taken out. And then we're going to increment the start, so it'll look like this, with the new start being slot 3, which is storing the D. Now let's go ahead and remove these operations just so I have more room to write here. Now the next thing we're going to do is just to keep going with this a little bit. And let's say we add, what would be next, H and I. That'll put the H in here and the I in here, and it will get the end equal to 8 like that. Then let's say we remove something. That'll produce the D out of the list and get it out of there, like so. And then let's add another item. Let's add J, I guess. That'll put the J in here and increment the 8 to a 9, giving us this situation. But now let's say we want to add HIJK to the list. What do we do? Well, we ran out of space in our array. So there's a few different ways we could solve this. The worst way would be to make a bigger array and fill it up with all of the data from the first array, and then you start using that array instead. That would be the wrong way to do this because we're not actually out of space in the array, right? We have four slots available. It's just there at the beginning of the array. So Imagine you had a queue where you were keeping track of, let's say, at most 20 items at a time, but you cycled through them a lot. You did lots of adding and lots of removing. It could be that you did that thousands of times. And so if you just expanded your array every time you got to the end, then you would be wasting a huge amount of space. You'd be having an array that was thousands and thousands of cells big, but only storing like 20 or less items at one point. So just expanding the array isn't the best way to go about it. We could do like a typewriter thing, like take all of these items that are in this side of the array and shift them down to the left to make space on the right again. You could do that, but that's not going to be terribly efficient either. Instead, the most efficient way to do this is to just slot the K in over here on the right. And instead of having your start be equal to 9, have your start wrap around and be equal to zero again. And so now it's sort of like a circular array in a way, in that now the start of the array is four, and it goes this way, and then it wraps around back to the beginning, and k is at zero. Likewise, if we add l to the array, then that's going to go into slot one here, and then the end is going to be one. This can also happen with your start variable. It can also wrap around. So if we removed E, F, G, H, I, and J all from the Q, then the next thing that would be removed would be the K. And so start would have to wrap around at the end when needed as well. So it's a bit more complicated than it was when we were dealing with just the stack with the one end. Now we have both ends and if one grows faster than the other, we might have to wrap around to the other side. So now let's start talking about the way that we could actually go ahead and implement this in code. So I have here a Q class, and we're going to write this based on an array. So the first thing we're going to need is actually the array of data that we're going to be storing. And to make this simpler, we can just hard code it to use integers. So I'm going to go ahead and say private int array like that. And then we also are going to need to keep track of the start and the end. So private int start and private int end. 
It's also going to be handy for keeping track of when we are needing to wrap around and so on if I keep track of the size in a separate variable because the size is going to be hard to figure out from just the start and the end variables itself because of the wraparound issue. So let's keep track of these four variables. Then in our constructor, the way it's going to work is we're going to be passing in the initial size of the array right here, the initial capacity of the array, I should say. The actual size of the queue is always going to start empty, just like a link list or just like a array list that you're used to using. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and set the array equal to a new array of whatever capacity we were given. I should have a better variable name for this. Capacity, single letter variable names are not great. Oh, that was not good. Okay, then we're going to, like I said, set the start and the end equal both to negative one. And then also the size of this thing is going to start off at zero, of course. So I think that's a good start for the data we need to keep track of when we're doing this and also the constructor which initializes them all to good default values. Now the next thing we need to worry about is the in-queue method which is going to be adding a new value to the end of the line. Okay, so let's talk about this then. We want to in-queue an item into this array and we'll use this one as an example and then we'll worry about maybe some edge cases that this thing isn't getting. Well, the start of our array is four and the end of our array is one, but we don't want to add it directly at end right now because end is the location of the current end of the array, but we want to put it just one past that basically. So the thing we're going to do first, I think, is increment end and do end plus plus. That will increment it from one to two. Then we will have it sort of indicating this empty cell right here, which is good that it's empty. We're going to go ahead and put something into it now. So what we can do is we can say that the array at the end is equal to the new item that we're inserting here. Then we're also going to have to increment the size because we need to keep track of that variable as well. So we're going to do size plus plus as well. All right, now there's one problem only with this, I think, as we have it written right now, which is that we have to handle that wraparound thing happening. So let's get a test case that tests that on the board here, like this. So we can talk and think about what should happen in this scenario. Again, coding data structures is impossible without having a diagram. So I'll just emphasize that one more time for y'all. So let's say it looks like this. The end is nine, uh, the start is four. If we just do end plus plus and then stick that item in the end, we're going to be putting it into this non-existent cell over here in slot 10. So after doing end plus plus, we have to do something else a little bit different. We have to do the wraparound thing. So we need to detect if we went off the end of this thing, which could be done by saying like, if end is equal to the array size, array.length. The array.length here would be 10 because there's 10 valid items, zero through nine. So if our end got to the length of the array, that means we went off of the end. And so we need to wrap back around to the other side by setting end back to zero. Then we can safely go ahead and set end equal to the item and do size plus plus, which would stick it over here in slot zero, which after this would be K, I guess leaving us in this situation. So I think that fixes that problem. Let's go ahead and put the code in for that. Okay, so back here, we could do the end plus plus, like I mentioned, and then check for wraparound. So if the end is equal to the array.length, then we're gonna set end back to zero. Then we can actually do the insertion and set array at this ending position equal to the new number that we're adding and do size plus plus. That I think should work in most of the cases. There is, I think, still one edge case that we haven't quite handled yet. And so it's always good to think about your edge cases. So what edge case could we have here that we haven't considered? Well. A common edge case is like, well, what if your thing is 
empty and it's the very first time you're doing this. So let's consider what would happen then. That would look like this, right? We have nothing in the array at all and start and end are both negative one. Well, what happens is we're going to go ahead and do end plus plus, setting this to zero. We're going to check if this is the end of the array and if so, go back to zero, but that's not gonna happen because it's not. Then we're going to go ahead and insert this new item. Let's say we're inserting A. That would do this, which is good. Then we're gonna do the size plus plus, which is good. I didn't draw size on here, but size would have started at zero and it would be now increment to one, which is good. But there's one other problem with this when we get to the end here, something we didn't do, which is to increment start as well, because if the very first thing is being added, then this is also the start of the array. And so if start is negative one at this point, I think we need to go ahead and increment it to zero. So we could do it like this. We can say that if the start is negative one at this point, then we would go ahead and set the start equal to the end because this is the only thing in here. We should go ahead and set it equal like this. So getting back to our code, we can just insert that at the end here and say, if start is equal to negative one, that means the list, the queue rather had been empty, then the start is now the same as the end because we only have the one item there. That one item is both the start of the queue and also the end of the queue. Now you might ask what about when the array gets full and we won't handle that because I don't wanna spend necessarily so long doing this, but the basic idea of what you'd have to do is you'd have to make a bigger array, but you couldn't just copy the data into the bigger array because it could be the case that the start and end are like in cells four and five of your array. And so if you copy the data into a bigger thing, you'd have to fix start and end. So you'd have to sort of like unroll it into a bigger array to handle this problem. And if you're curious about that, you can ask me and I'll go through it in more detail. But for now, we're just going to ignore the possibility of the queue getting filled and then wanting to resize it. For now, we'll just say, hey, this queue is full. You, you shouldn't add any more to it. All right. Now, the next thing to handle is the DQ method. So let's talk about how to do that. All right, so let's look at this basic kind of case first, where the start is zero, the end is two, and size is three. The thing that should be DQ'd then and kicked out of this queue is the A. That should be the thing that comes out. So let's talk about how we're going to do that. Well, it's kind of like the pop method from the stack where we want to remove this thing out of the data structure, but then we also have to return it at the end. And so just like before, we're going to basically make like a temporary variable for storing the thing we're gonna remove. So we can say temp equals array at the start location first to keep track of the thing that we're eventually gonna return. And so now A will be again, not taken out of the array, but we're going to ignore it. And so now to fix our variables, what we're going to do is instead of end plus plus, like we did for in queue, now we're going to do start plus plus like this. And start is going to be incremented from zero to one like that. But we have the same problem we had before where we might have to deal with the wraparound effect because if our item got to be such that we had the start item over here, K, and then the rest of the items were over here waiting to be dequeued. When we increment this nine for the start variable to 10, we would have to see that that's off the end of the array and we'd have to wrap it back around to zero again. So just like we did for end, we're gonna have to say if start is equal to the capacity of the array, then start wraps around back to zero as well, which gives us this. And we would now have this situation after start wrapped around, start is back at zero. The end of this thing now is three and there's four items. But there's only four items because <laughs> after doing this, taking this K out, we have to go ahead and decrement the size, size minus minus as well. So that's the basic idea behind it. We keep track of the thing we're going to return, which at the very end of the method is going to be the thing that gets sent back, return temp. 
Then we go ahead and increment the start to move on to the next item to be returned next time we call DQ, except that if we went off the end of the array, we wrap around back to zero and we decrement size. The one edge case that we then have to worry about is if we, again, like for in queue, the edge case was what if the thing is empty and it's the very first thing we're adding. Now it's what if this is the very last thing in the queue and we're removing it. Let's see what that would look like. It would look like this. We would set temp to be the thing in start, which would be the zero, the O, I guess it is. And then we would do start plus plus, incrementing this to four. Then we would check if it fell off the edge and it didn't, so we move on. And then we would do size minus minus, decrementing the one down to a zero. But then we can't just return because now our queue is in sort of an inconsistent state. And if we call DQ again, it wouldn't like realize it was empty. So what we basically have to do is put it back into sort of like the default empty state if size is equal to zero. So if size is equal to zero here, what we can do is we can go ahead and set the start back to negative one and the end back to negative one as well, putting it back in sort of the default empty queue configuration. So putting that into the code would then look like this. We would go ahead and start again by saving the return value. I'll give it a better variable name. Return val is equal to the array at the start location. And then we do start plus plus, but then we check if it went off the edge. So if the start is equal to the array dot length, then we have to wrap it around back to zero, start equals zero like this. Then we decrement our size, size minus minus, and then we check if we decremented it all the way down to zero, in which case we put our start back to negative one and our end back to negative one. Then the only thing that remains is to return our return value variable that we saved at the beginning of the method. Now, these methods would be better, I'm not gonna do it right now for simplicity's sake, but these would be better if we went ahead and threw exceptions in a couple of cases. So because we're not checking if the thing is full or not, uh, we're not doing the resize, which, which I said we would skip, we should at least go ahead and say, if this thing is full at this point, throw an exception. And if this thing is empty, when you call DQ, it should throw an exception, but we're just gonna ignore that for right now. The rest of these are pretty easy to deal with. Um, we can just return the size because we're keeping track of that in a variable. I spelt this wrong. Return size. When size is equal to zero, it's empty. And so I explained this code last week when you can just return a Boolean directly. And then we can do the same thing for this one and return whether or not the size is equal to the array.length like that. And so I think this does it for the queue. Um, like I said, we could go ahead and put those exceptions in, but we'll go ahead and skip it right now. That shouldn't be too hard to add if you want it to later. Now the rest of this little program here, the main, already goes ahead and makes a queue. And it does it to show you the sort of like buffering idea. And so what it does is it makes a queue of size 10, then it makes a scanner, then it keeps going while num is greater than zero. And so it's basically reading in from the scanner in integer, and it keeps going while that's a positive integer. Each time it does, what it does is it enqueues that number, and then it keeps going until the buffer is full. When the buffer is full, it prints them all out together. So basically it buffers 10 numbers that you're entering, and then when the buffer is full, it prints out all of the items dequeued from the buffer until it's empty one after the other. So let's go ahead and compile this and see what happens. And we'll also see if I made any mistakes again. Let's go ahead and compile arrayq.java. And there's no compiler errors, but that doesn't mean it is gonna work. All right, so we're running arrayq. And then what I said that it would do is it would keep track of numbers until it got to 10 and then it prints all of the buffered numbers out for you. And so that's basically what it's doing. It keeps track of all of these. And then when it's full, it prints them back out to you 
in the same order that they were given in as, and then if you put a negative in, it stops. So this happens all the time in systems, operating systems and file systems and networks and stuff like that, that we don't just like print out or transmit or deal with data directly when you get it. Instead, what you do is you have a buffer size and when the buffer is filled, you send it. So for instance, if you're writing a network program, this is going to be hidden from you as the programmer, but if you're writing a network program that's sending data over the network and you send like little snippets of information, it's going to keep those in a buffer. And then when it has a decent amount, it's going to send them all together because that's more efficient. So that's just sort of another application of queues, keeping these sort of like data buffers going. And so it seems like our queue implementation worked. This is going to cause the wraparound to happen when we use this program because we filled it up several times as, as we were going through. All right, so we have now talked about how to use an array to keep track of a queue. We can talk about how to use a linked list to keep track of a queue as well. And so it's actually not too complicated at all we would, unlike a stack, we would want to use a doubly linked list. And we have our head, therefore, and also our tail of the doubly linked list. And so we might have a doubly linked list that looks like this with, let's say, five items. And we have our next and prev links both happening. So it might look like this. This, of course, would point off to null, and this, of course, would point off to null here, the previous link from head. So you would have a basic doubly linked list. And the reason you need a doubly linked list is because in a queue, of course, the important thing is that you add to one side of the data and you remove from the other side of the data. And so it wouldn't really matter if you add to the head and remove from the tail or the other way around as long as you were consistent. So let's say we were going to add to the head and then remove from the tail. Well, it's not too hard to imagine what your in queue and DQ methods would be. Your in queue method we already talked about. We talked about how do you add to the beginning of a doubly linked list. That's exactly what you'd have to do for the in queue method. And then the DQ method we'll cover right here. We didn't have a DQ method when we talked about doubly linked list. We didn't talk about how to remove specifically the last item from a doubly linked list. We had a more general remove method that could remove any of the nodes. But we can talk about it real quick. It won't be too complicated. There's basically only two things we have to do. The first thing we would have to do is change the tail link to instead point to the node previous to it. And then we would also have to change this next link to instead point to null. So let's think about that. Well, what we can first do is set tail equal to tail.prev, right? Because this tail link was going to be set equal to the tail.prev of it. And that would point this link right here over here, like that. Now that we're, we, let's assume for now, like we did before, that this thing wasn't empty when we went to DQ it, but it might be empty now. We might have just DQ'd the last thing. And so in that case, tail.prev would be null, and we would have set tail to null, which is okay. So I think in order to be consistent with the way we've done it before, we would have to say if tail is now equal to null, that means there's nothing in the list anymore, and we would have to go ahead and set head to null as well. For that to work. Oops. Um, semicolons, that's what we do. Otherwise, there's at least one thing in the list still, and we're going to have to set tail.next equal to null, because this is now the last item in the list. Tail.next equals null. Just like that. And that should do it. So it's pretty straightforward, really to use a doubly linked list as the implementation for your queue. We're not going to go ahead and have a whole code example for this, but that's basically exactly what you would do. You would add to the beginning of the linked list, which is something we've talked about before, and you would use a little algorithm like this to remove from the linked list. Oops, one thing I did forget though is returning the thing. So again, we would have to do something like this where we say the return value is equal to tail.data first, 
and then at the end we can go ahead and return that. But otherwise I think this works. You can use a linked list or an array to implement the queue just like the stack. So that's all for this example today. The notes page here for today has the array queue.java code example that we went through. And then it also talks about how you would do this with a linked list. But like I said, we don't have a big code example for that. Next time in this class, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about one algorithm that relies on a queue called the breadth first search algorithm, which can be used for lots and lots of different types of searching problems. The one we're going to look at it particularly for is searching your way through a maze, which is, I don't know, uh, kind of a cool way to, to look at it. Then we're going to talk about a very related algorithm called the depth first search algorithm, which is similar, but instead of using a queue, it uses a stack. So that's what we're talking about next time. Like always, let me know if you have any questions. Thanks.